to be glad also with exceeding joy. Let's just have a brief word of prayer as we begin this morning. Father, I thank you for these young people. Thank you for the great privilege it is to open the Word of God and to share it with them. Father, we would ask that your Spirit might do a wonderful work in our hearts and lives and warm our hearts to the truths of Scripture. May our lives be changed for your glory and for your namesake as we ask it in the name and through the blood of the precious Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to bring a message this morning entitled, The Most Difficult Class You're Ever Going to Take. I'd like for you here this morning just to think about that for a moment. Think back to maybe your high school years or to even think to your current situation. What would you say is the most difficult, challenging class that you've taken so far? For me, it was organic chemistry. I was a pre-med student uh, at the time that the Lord saved me, and I was contemplating having to take what was a required course at that time, and I heard all of these horror stories of more people dropping out of the class than young people actually finishing the class. But I decided I was going to go ahead with it. We met in rather a cold, informal type setting of about 250 students. Uh, I did not receive the one-on-one -on -one help that I desperately needed for that kind of a class. It started swamping me, overwhelming me. I started watching guys dropping like flies uh, around me, so to speak. But I hung in there for a while. Then eventually I came to the place, I I'm just not going to pass this class. I'm going to drop it with hopes of picking it up later on. And to be very honest with you, I was rather immature in my life at that time, being newly saved, I didn't have a whole lot of discipline. I really didn't have a whole lot of focus. And I felt that I'm just not going to make, make it through. Let's just end all the misery right here and now. And so I did. And I thought I could pick it up, but then God worked in my heart, started moving in the direction of full-time vocational ministry, and I never had to go through that again. I'll tell you, folks, it was a brutal class. And over the years, I've discovered something, and that's this. Organic chemistry is not the most difficult class I've had to take. As a matter of fact, far from it. I have discovered, and I believe everyone here to some degree, if you know Christ as your Savior, has discovered this. The single most difficult class you will ever take is a class of trials. Trials and testings. And I've learned that I am neither the first nor the last. I'm not one of the select few that is required to take this class. Every one of God's children has to take it. As a matter of fact, it was the Apostle Peter who wrote to some of the first that would have to take it. July 19th, in the year 64 A.D., during the reign of Nero, emperor of Rome, the city of Rome was consumed in a holocaust of fire. And the fire spread rapidly, and the fire lasted for three days. And you have to understand something about Rome in that time. Rome was made up of wooden tenement houses. I mean, they were side by side. And when this fire broke out, there was literally nothing you could do about it. And the Roman populace was very upset because they believed that Nero was responsible, that he had some grandiose plans of building this new upgrade city, and that he had burned it on purpose. It was kind of interesting that while it was burning, he was sitting up in one of his towers, and he was watching it, gleefully enjoying the flames. He personally instructed all of his soldiers that they were not to aid in the putting out of that fire. They were to hinder the people from doing so. In this fire, the people lost everything. They lost their homes, but they lost their religious temples, their household gods, everything. And so their resentment ran very deep. They had to blame somebody. Nero didn't want to be blamed for it, so he looked for a scapegoat. And guess where he found it? Christians. Christians, they were already hated. These were the people who ate human flesh in what was called communion. These were people who drank blood. These were people who had unbridled lust because they gave to one another what was called a holy kiss. And the very mere profession of being a Christian 
was a crime. So as a result, what Nero did is he took Christians, he soaked them in pitch, put them on poles, and he made them lighting elements to his garden parties. They took Christians and they sewed them in wild animal skins for hunting dogs to devour. They nailed them to crosses. They stretched them out over the rack. And they took them into the arenas and into the amphitheaters. And they allowed the lions and the panthers to devour them. And they subjected the women to the most awful atrocities you can possibly imagine. So when this book was written, right after that time, about 64 A.D., Believers everywhere were going through what might be called a fiery trial. And so when Peter used the word fiery trial, they would immediately think back to the burning of Rome, or perhaps even to their brothers and sisters in Christ atop those torches. And he wrote to these early believers, and he gave to them some guiding principles to take into this class. Because Peter knew the class, somewhat like organic chemistry, it's going to be grueling. It's going to be incomprehensibly difficult. It's going to be challenging to the point where, young people, you are going to want to say in your Christian life, I want to drop the class. I've been there. I pastored for 24 years. I have been there. I want to drop the class. And maybe you're there this morning, and maybe there's at times when you feel in the midst of this fiery trial, this required course, that you say, I feel abandoned by God. So this morning, if you're a little worn out, you're a little worked over by all the pain and all the challenges and all of the pressure-filled situations in life that may seem absolutely unendurable, whether it's money whether it's coursework, whether it's friends, whether it's family back home, whatever the situation might be, may I share with you this morning this. God has given to us a course syllabus. If we look at the syllabus, if we follow the syllabus, there is hope, there is strength, and we can get through this class not just getting by and not just having said we endured, but we can go through it and find it to be not only the most difficult class, but the most rewarding class there is in life. And that's what God wants for me, and that's what God wants for each and every one of you young people. So what are some of the things we find in this course syllabus, in this passage that we're looking at here this morning? Well, I find the first guiding principle in this syllabus to be this. How to react. How to react to the most difficult class in the world. And he says here in verse 12, think it not strange. Interestingly, surprise is usually our first response to trials. Isn't it, young people? You know, we, we have something happen to us, and here's what we say. Why is this happening to me? Why me? What did I do to deserve this? Uh, where did this come from? And even though that is the most natural human response to trials, it can often be the most detrimental. The problem is, is that Peter says there is a better way to react to trials in our life. And that is this. Do not think it's strange when these trials come upon you. And when you look at that word there in verse 12, the word strange, the idea is, is that what Peter is forbidding is this continuing bewilderment and astonishment at what's happening. In other words, you can't just sit in the corner of your room and say, why me? What did I do to deserve this? I come to this school and I find this kind of a situation. Why me? Don't go on with that bewilderment. Especially in light of all that we find in the remainder of this passage. Look what it says here in verse 12, if we want to move ahead here for just a moment and into the verse. Concerning the fiery trial that is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. In other words, if this is a course that is required for life, are there not some certain things that go along with this course called trials? Can I say this? Tests? 
Does anyone know of a class that you take here at Clearwater that doesn't have a test of some sort, written, oral, or otherwise? Why should we be surprised that when God brings trials into our life, they are not in the form of testing? Tests are a part of our life in the pursuit of an educational degree. And neither should we be surprised that we have tests within the curriculum of going on to Christ-likeness. Maturity in the Christian life is measured by our ability to withstand the tests that come our way without having them shake our foundation or throw us into an emotional tailspin. How mature are you? How mature are you? I remember when I would teach high school Bible class. <laughs> it's amazing, and I don't know if it changes at all sometimes when we get into college. But I would tell young people, I'd say, now we're going to have pop quizzes in this class. And they'd look at me, okay, yeah, right, we understand. So two days later, I'd say, all right, I want you to put all your books away. We're going to have a pop quiz. Oh, what? A pop quiz? You didn't tell us that. And what they meant is, I didn't tell them either that morning, give them a personal call, or the day before, something like that. Tell them two days before. We're going to have pop quizzes. What? I had one girl, no joke, whenever I would give a quiz, she'd start crying. The tears are just coming down her cheeks. And then you've got this geek kid over to the side. Oh, oh boy, we get to have a quiz. Remember that kid in your class? You just wanted to take him by his pants and just kind of pitch him out the window. Just totally Fruit Loops. And I'm saying, what did you expect? This is an educational environment. It's a class. Did you expect anything else? So, in other words, don't think it's strange that you're going to be tested in a required course. But here's something that Peter brings out here that we have to get. Listen very carefully. A reaction to trials has to go beyond just not being surprised. Because most of the kids in the class, the one girl, she's over there crying. The geek's over here, you know. <laughs> goody, goody. Most of the kids are going, yeah, all right. And they take their books, and they lay them aside, and they pull out the pen and the paper, and they take the quiz. That's not good enough. If that's our response to the trials that God brings into our life. What Peter says here is that it should include rejoicing. Now, that's not the same as the goofball over here that's clapping his hands, you know, and getting all excited about something, and maybe he's going to get a D for the first time, you know, after getting an F. I don't know. That's not the response. The idea is, is that there is to be in our hearts continual rejoicing. As a matter of fact, the structure here in uh, verse 12 in the Greek language is keep on rejoicing. Remember what James says, count it all joy, brethren, when you meet trials, when you fall into diverse testings, trials of various kinds. Why should we sit in trials and be joyful in our spirit? Why should we be happy about what God is doing? It's this. These trials will help us meet a higher end. If we go through trials, listen carefully, we will be brought into fellowship with Christ's sufferings. Who was Jesus? Of all the things you can say about Jesus, listen carefully. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And during his three and a half years of earthly ministry, do you know what Jesus experienced everywhere he went? Grief. He experienced intense hatred from others. May I say to you, whenever you go through a trial, whether it's in an educational environment, whether it's in a home environment, whether it's in a relational environment of some sort, may I say this to young people, you will never be given a greater opportunity to fellowship with Jesus Christ as you will in the midst of that trial. You will be never given a greater opportunity. Look what it says in verse 13. Rejoice in so much as ye are partakers. And the word there is for fellowship. Fellowship of Christ's sufferings. That when His glory shall be revealed, 
ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. For in the hour that you go through trials, you will understand and you will experience Jesus Christ there with you, alongside of you, and you will know the intimacy of the one who has been there before you. And it is worth it. Nothing can be given in exchange for that that will amount to that. As a matter of fact, if you look at verse 13 here, it says, If we go through these trials with the right attitude of rejoicing in our hearts, it will result in our being glad also with exceeding joy. And it means this. One day when we see Jesus Christ, we will be so looking for Him, we will have been so focused on Him, that the joy that we have in going through trials to experience His fellowship will only be heightened with ecstatic joy at seeing Him face to face. My friends, that is one reason that trials come, that we look forward to His coming and we have great anticipation in joy. So keep on being happy in trials. For one day, you're going to be ecstatic. Notice something else here that we find in this syllabus. We not only find here, the first thing here, uh, principle to remember, and that is how to react. Now we see what to remember in verses 14 to 18. For if you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Okay, in other words, go to the syllabus in times of trial when you want to drop the class. And he tells you, here's what you have to remember. If we keep certain things in mind in the midst of any trial, it's going to encourage us greatly. And I want to share with you, very briefly, four things you have to remember in times of trial. And that's this. Number one, according to verse 14, trials give us an opportunity to draw upon maximum power. Let me say that again. Trials give us the opportunity to draw upon maximum power. You see that word there? Notice what it says in uh, verse 14. The spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. Think back to the Old Testament, and we have the Shekinah. Do you know what the Shekinah was? That was that visible manifestation of God in the form of a glorious, light, dazzling cloud that came down upon the tabernacle in the Old Testament and rested above the Ark of the Covenant where the angels' wings were outstretched and there was the mercy seat and the glory of God would fill that entire holy of holy areas. What's he saying here? That was the essential attribute visible of God being there. And this glory will rest upon you, symbolic of power and of God's presence. Keep it in mind, when you go through trials and you respond in the right way, the spirit of glory and of God is resting upon you. Let me give you an illustration of this. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 15, Stephen's being stoned. Before that, he had to meet with the religious council. Actually, chapter 7, excuse me, but in chapter 6, okay, back up to the first part, uh, the end part of it. And you have Stephen in that passage of Scripture brought before the council, and they they just castigate him. And they say all these horrible things about him, about what he believes. And listen to what it says. They looked upon his face, and it shone as an angel. What was it? They saw there resting upon Stephen the glory and the Spirit of Christ upon him in great power. And that's why Stephen could say, Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Keep in mind that you are never closer and never more a recipient of strength than when you're going through trials with the right attitude. Secondly, second thing we must remember, most suffering should in no way cause us to feel shame. 
It says here in this passage of Scripture in verse 15, we've got to be careful that we don't suffer for wrongdoing. Young people, if you are going through a trial right now and it's because you lied, it's because you cheated, it's because you did something wrong, it's because you've gotten into something you shouldn't be involved in, don't glory in that. Make sure that you look at what's going on in your life and be very, very careful that what is going on in your life is something that God has brought in the course of your walking faithfully with Him. And He wants to bless you. It should never cause you shame. Well, people are going to think that I've been doing something bad when I have to go through a trial and some physical problem comes upon me. People are going to think I'm not walking with God. Let them think what they want. They should never cause us to feel shame. Thirdly, suffering is usually timely and needed. That's the third thing we need to remember. It's usually timely and needed. Matter of fact, in verse 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Young people, one of the most difficult things for us to remember is this. My life needs purging and so does yours. I mean, we believe in spring cleaning. We believe in fall cleaning around the house, so to speak. The same thing needs to go on in our hearts. There needs to be purging. And the good news is, we are not going to be among those who are lost because it talks about where the ungodly is going to appear. God loves His own first to be very careful to deal with matters in their life because He loves them and cares about them. And fourthly, the last one here that we have to remember. There is no comparison between what we suffer now and what the unrighteous are going to suffer later. If you think that this is the worst thing that could ever happen, that you're going through a trial, my friends, just read Revelation chapter 20 and look at the great white throne judgment. And you will thank God for His merciful grace in your life and saving your soul. It will be nothing like what the lost are going to have to go through. Keep these things in mind. They will help you to go through this trial. And then lastly here this morning, there's a third guiding principle that comes out from this passage. And it's found in verse 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. In other words, the third guiding principle is this. Remember how to react, what to remember, and thirdly, on whom to rely. The syllabus tells us on whom we are to rely. The word there, commit, I like it. It's the word entrust. The idea is you go to the bank. Uh, Usually college young people go to the bank to withdraw more than to deposit. I realize that. You go to the bank, and you're going to take money out of your wallet, and you're going to put it across the teller's desk, and you're going to deposit it. You're going to entrust them with that money to the extent that they may even give you a little bit of interest, even if it is only 1.5% today. But you put that money in the bank because you believe it's safer than keeping it in a mattress or sewing in a curtain somewhere at home. It's better than you watching over it. And the same is true in the Christian life. That when we go through trials, let's make a deposit. Let's entrust our souls to the one who truly cares about us. Because why? He is a faithful creator. I want to share something with you here this morning that comes from C.S. Lewis. And I don't know how much young people read C.S. Lewis. I read a little bit. And I came across this. And bear with me in conclusion here this morning. But listen to what this man said exactly pertaining to what we're talking about here this morning. Lewis says, I am progressing along a path in my life. In my contentedly ordinary, fallen, and godless condition. I'm absorbed in merry meeting with my friends for the tomorrow or a bit of work that tickles my vanity today. A holiday, a new book. And I'm going on with this, he says, until suddenly there is a stab of abdominal pain that threatens some new disease. Or I come across a headline in the newspapers that threaten us all with destruction. This was the day before terrorism. And it sends this whole pack of cards in my life tumbling down. At first, I'm overwhelmed. And all of my little happinesses look like broken toys. Then slowly and reluctantly, bit by bit, I try to bring myself into a frame of mind that I should have at all times. I remind myself that all of these toys that I have been pursuing, 
were never intended to possess my heart. That my true good is in another world, and my only real treasure is in Jesus Christ. And perhaps, by God's grace, I succeed in doing this for a day or two, to be consciously dependent upon God and upon drawing upon His strength from the right sources. But the moment the threat is withdrawn, my whole nature leaps back to the toys. And then he comes to the most important statement. Thus, the terrible necessity of trials is only too clear. God has me for about 48 hours. The stab of abdominal pain. The newspaper line that threatens destruction. Something horrible is about to happen. God has me for about 48 hours, and then only because He has taken everything else away from me. But let Him sheathe that sword for a moment. And I behave like a puppy when the hated bath is over. I've got a Maltese, a dog. We call it a Maltosaurus. All eight pounds of her. She hates the bath. You say the word bath, she runs and hides behind the couch. We hunt her down, the Maltosaurus. And we take her and we hold her and wash her and get her all groomed up. And when she's all wet, and I learned this when I came to Indianapolis, when we let her go, she takes off on the Daisy 500. She starts going around the house just in this frantic zip, 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 zip. I mean, she's going over everything and under everything, just flying around. Can't wait to get outside to go and roll in something that is absolutely disgusting. How many times does that happen to us? God has us, doesn't he, when there's a financial pinch. And God has us when there's a course that's too much for us to handle. And God has us when there's a physical difficulty. But the moment that God sheaths his sword, we're like a puppy when the bath is over. And we return to our former ways. God's given us a syllabus. If we use it, we will not drop the course which would grieve God who brought this course for our blessing and not our detriment. Trials are coming, young people. You've experienced them as a believer. There's going to be more. Don't drop the class. It is the most difficult class you'll ever take. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Thank you, our Father, for the Scriptures, for the Spirit, for the truth. Thank you, Father, that you've allowed us to open it today, and we pray your blessing upon that which has been set forth. In Jesus' name, amen.